welcome to our uh, first uh, ministry meeting of this semester, uh, spring 2014. I hope you all are excited to be here. Um, so uh, for those of you who are just joining us or just uh, as a review, the overall topic that we are going over, as you can see on the top of your sheet here, is entitled The Way of Faith. The Way of Faith. And where this comes from is uh, we've been covering and will continue to cover from the New Testament, the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And as you can see, even right from the very first verse on your sheet, Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Now faith is the substantiation of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So faith is the... So actually what Hebrews 11 does is it presents to us a definition of faith, and then, uh, of course, you know, in your classes, many times you, uh, like say in math class, you study some theorems, you study some... Uh, uh, some things related to math, but then the helpful thing is to go through the examples, right? Because uh, without the examples, it's tough to solve the problems. So what Hebrews 11 mostly does, firstly it presents a definition of faith, but then it goes through and presents many examples, right. examples of faith, yeah. all right? And mainly, obviously, Hebrews 11 is referencing ones in the Old Testament. Last uh, semester, we covered uh, Abel, we covered Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So we covered a lot of these different, very positive examples of faith. And we will continue this semester, beginning with Moses, and we'll go through the end of Hebrews 11. But just to step back, uh, we read this first verse. What, what is faith? How, how do we define faith? Faith is not so easy to define. But uh, it is. this is probably the clearest definition of faith in the Bible. Hebrews 11, 1, if someone says, what is faith? Where can we find what is faith in the Bible? Uh, surely we need to point them to Hebrews 11, 1. And actually, if you look at different translations, many different words are used for this verse. But this is a very helpful one here. It says, faith is the substantiation of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. All right, there are things that are hoped for and there are things not seen. And what is faith? Faith is to substantiate, to make real what is hoped for, what we may not have now, what, what's in the future. And also, what is faith? Faith is the conviction or the assurance of things not seen. There are, there are many things that are not seen related to the Lord. In fact, all that the Lord is doing is mainly in the unseen realm. And what is faith? Faith is the conviction of things not seen. All right? So that's our working definition of faith based on Hebrews 11. Now, uh, why is faith important? All right, why is faith important? Let's, how about let's all together read Hebrews 11.6, the second verse on your sheet. Let's read it out loud together. But without faith, it is impossible to be well pleasing to him. For he who comes forward to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. All right, is faith important? Yeah. Yeah. All right, why is it important? Without faith, it is impossible to be well-pleasing to Him. All right, no faith, there is, there's no possibility of being well-pleasing to the Lord, all right? So uh, now the second part is important as well. He who comes forward to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. All right, so... Uh, we see the importance of faith, all right? Something that we covered last semester. One, uh, one verse that's not here, uh, in fact, uh, maybe you can just ask the person next to you. If you were here last semester, you should know the answer to this question. If not, give it your best guess, all right? What is the source of faith? Where does faith come from? Based on Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith comes out of hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Hearing through the word of Christ, all right? So, what, what is the source of faith? Faith comes out of hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ, all right? Without the word, um, there's no source of faith, all right? Faith comes from hearing the word, hearing the word. So, that's why we gather together. What are we doing? We're gathering together to hear the word, and through the word, our faith is strengthened and uplifted. So, yes, we can be well-pleasing to God. 
Amen. Now, specifically today, we are coming to Moses, all right? We're coming to Moses. Let me read you these verses, and what we're going to do is we're going to draw a little uh, compare and contrast chart, all right? There's, Moses is making a choice in these verses, and there are certain things that are on one side, and then there are certain things that are on the other side. So we want to look at these two sides, all right? Now, as, so as we read these verses, you consider if you were doing a little chart, what would you put on one side, and what would you put on the other side? So let me read it to you. Hebrews 11, 24 through 27. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be ill-treated with the people of God than to have the temporary enjoyment of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked away to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he persevered as one seeing the unseen one. All right, so on your chart, I'm going to start off uh, on this side. I'm just going to put the sun. Oh, it's worse. Right. <laughs> the son of Pharaoh's um, daughter, all right? So the son of Pharaoh's daughter, all right? Now, what, what else do we put on this side, all right? What, what else do you put on this side? Temporary enjoyment. Okay, the next, uh, yeah, the next thing in the order of the verses there is the temporary enjoyment of sin. All right? Then what else do you put? Third thing I'll put is the treasures of Egypt, right? Treasures of Egypt. Okay, let, let's let's uh, let's just take these three items. All right, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, the temporary enjoyment of sin, and the treasures of Egypt. Now, if you look at Acts seven, um, let, let me read these verses to you too. All right, Acts seven twenty two through twenty four. And Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in his words and works. So he was, he, was, he was educated, he was wise, he was powerful, and he was the son, actually, uh, in, in, there, there's a whole story to this, we don't have time to get into, but uh, he, he was, uh, in the Old Testament, he was drawn out of the water, um, he was the son of God's, he was actually the son of two God-fearing parents who were part of the children of Israel, but Pharaoh's daughter took him in as her own son. And because of that, he was considered to be part of the royal household. Um, very wise and very powerful. He surely had a bright future as a part of Pharaoh's household. Right? Um, then, of course, you have these two other items. All right. Now, over here, what we put on this side? Okay, the first thing uh, you put on this side is ill-treated with the people of God. Right? What did he choose? Moses chose to be ill-treated with the people of God rather than to have the temporary enjoyment of sin. Right? Okay, what else? The reproach of Christ. The reproach of Christ, right? And then, uh, anything else you put over here? I'm gonna put. I'm gonna put reward. All right, reward. For he looked away to the reward. So we have these two contrasting um, worlds. We have these two contrasting worlds where we have the enjoyment 
albeit temporary, of sin. We have the treasures of Egypt. We have the son of Pharaoh's daughter, the royal household. Surely, uh, it, it, hard, it, it, it doesn't get much better than that in terms of you know, your, your fame, your uh, power. Um, at the same time, although Moses had this, he, he chose to abandon this. And instead, he chose this side. And uh, if you just look at, at these two things here, it doesn't seem that good, right? Uh, Ill-treated and reproach, all right? Um, but, okay, now, now this is why it begins with by faith, Amen. all right? Because faith completely changes everything. If we look at this just objectively from the world standpoint, and by the way, Egypt in the Old Testament, it signifies just the world, uh, the world system. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't make sense why someone would choose this side over this side. Yeah. But as soon as we have faith, okay. all right, yeah. actually, we, we can see that this side is, is much more valuable than what's on this side. But it's related to faith. All right, it's related to faith. Now, how, obviously, this is, uh, out, outwardly, this seems like a difficult choice. But what, what would motivate, what motivated Moses to make this choice? According to these verses, what motivated him to do such a crazy thing? Um, and uh, this is what we, what we want to see, all right? What, what motivated him to do it was uh, the reward, right? It says, for he looked away to the reward. He looked away to the reward. Now, my question to you is, what is the reward? Just based on these verses right here, what is the reward? What would you say? All right. Well, this is what I would say. All right, and, and there is, there, there's more than one answer you can give here. But this is the answer I'm going to use this morning. It says, he looked away to the reward, and then in the next verse it says, he saw the unseen one. All right? So what was he looking at? One verse says he was looking at the reward. What does the next verse say he was looking at? The unseen one. So what's his reward? The unseen one. That's right. That was his reward. All right? Um, also, uh, if you look at Hebrews 12.2, this is an awesome verse. Let's read this all together. Hebrews 12.2. Looking away unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. So again, Hebrews 11, it says, looking away to the reward. The next chapter, Hebrews 12, 2, what does it say? Looking away unto Jesus. All right, there it is. For sure, for us today. And you know, it's really interesting. You might think, wait, wait a minute. Jesus wasn't born until many years after Moses. Christ, Jesus Christ, how could, how could you say that Moses bore the reproach of Christ and that the reward he looked away to was Jesus? Well, I'm not sure. That's what the Bible says, all right? Um, there, there is a sense in which Christ, even uh, as the angel of Jehovah, was with his people in the Old Testament. So he was there. And um, there's, there's some, I wish we had more time. If you look at Exodus 3, the way Moses was called, many people remember the burning bush, but they forget that what happened was an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the, in the burning bush. The angel, so they miss the angel. Remember the bush, but you forget the angel. And that angel is the Lord. All right, anyways, the reward, all right? He looked away to the reward. Amen. And uh, for sure for us today, what's our reward? And what should we look away unto? We should look away unto Jesus, right? Amen. All right. Um, the, these verses are, are, are really precious. First uh, Peter 1.8, right? It says, Whom having not seen, you love. Into whom, though not seeing him at, him at present, Yet believing, you exult with joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. You know, in the song that we sang, Amazing Grace, right, in verse 1 it says, I was blind, but now I see. 
Remember that? Yeah. Now, that, that, the author of that song was not physically blind. Um, what was he talking about? John Newton. He was talking about the inner eyes of his heart being open to see. And what did he see? He saw the Lord Jesus. Amen. All right? He saw the Lord. He saw the Lord's grace. All right? So that's what we're talking about. Moses, Moses may have had a physical seeing of the Lord Jesus, of the angel of Jehovah, excuse me, uh, in our experience today. But, it, but, but at the same time, it says he saw the unseen one. He saw the unseen one. So actually, um, you know, there are many, there are many different, you know, uh, pictures of Jesus, statues, whatever. But you know what? What we really need to do is we really need to see him as the unseen one. Not, not with our physical eyes, but with the inner eyes of our heart. That's, uh, that's how we see the Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Now, I want to, I want to, um, just, uh, look at some verbs, right? We looked at some nouns in Hebrews 11, 24 through 27. Let's look at some verbs. All right, let's work backwards. From the end of Hebrews 11, 27, uh, there's this word, persevere. <coughs> right? So Moses persevered. You know what? The semester is a long semester. Uh, we're going January through May. There's a lot of things that are going to happen, uh, a lot of ups and downs, difficult times, great times, and a lot of neither great nor terrible times. Um, and what do we need to do this semester? Persevere. All right, we need to persevere. But where does persever perseverance come from? All right. Um, before he persevered, uh, I like these two words. He uh, chose choose and refuse. All right. It's hard to persevere if we haven't chose, if we haven't chosen, if we haven't made a definite choice to choose um, this side and to refuse this side. All right. Choose and refuse. All right. And something I, I forgot to point out here. Of course, you have ill-treated and reproach, but even more importantly, what you have is the people of God and Christ, all right? The people of God and Christ. So it, it's, if we just look at this, not so easy to choose. But if we look at this, then we can choose, all right? We choose and then we refuse, all right? But what it, it, it takes some guts to choose, to choose this side. It takes guts to do that. And to refuse this side, because it's not easy to do. So where did that choosing and considering and refusing come from? Uh, the verb before that is what? Consider. Right? That's what it says, right? Consi uh, consider. Oh, sorry. The, the way the verse... So, so um, he chose to be ill-treated with the people of God than to have the temporary enjoyment of sin, considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Right? So, before he chose and refused, he had some consideration. Considering. Alright? He was considering. But then, what affected his considering? And this is what it really, this is the source. This goes back to the source. Um, was His seeing and his looking away, right? I like how it how that verse. Uh, you see how this is like mostly it's one sentence there, um, but at the very end it says for meaning because he looked away to the reward, mm -hmm. because he looked away. How could he? How could he persevere? First, he had to choose. How did he choose? He considered. What affected his consideration was he saw the Lord. He looked away to the Lord, and that's what kept him going. So ultimately, what will cause us to persevere is our looking away to the Lord. Amen. So I have a question for you based on Job 42.5. Job 42.5 says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen you. All right? Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, have you heard about the Lord? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think all of us in this room, if not before today, at least... We, we got a few minutes already. But the question is not, have you heard about the Lord? The question is, have you seen Him? Have you seen the Lord? And again, this is not a physical sing. This is an inward sing. All right? And until 
we can hear all we want. If we just hear, um, we, we won't be able to choose this side. It'll be very difficult. But as soon as we see, looking away, then in our consideration, the Lord will be so lovely. We will choose. We will choose him. We will refuse this side. And we will be able to persevere. Amen. Now, Acts 22, uh, let's just, I, I like this. These, these are awesome verses. This is Saul. He's there. He's asking a question. Who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. But rise up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a minister and a witness of both of the things in which you have seen me and of the things in which I will appear to you. All right. This is a, so say like, how, you might be thinking, oh, have I seen the Lord? How much of the Lord have I seen? Well, uh, what should we do? We should just, this is, this is not about prayer. Who are you, Lord? Lord Jesus, who are you? I want to see you. Amen. Reveal yourself to me. Now, what I like about this is at the end it says, the things in which you have seen me in the past and of the things in which I will appear to you. In other words, our whole Christian life, from the very beginning, there should be a seeing of the Lord Jesus. But it shouldn't stop. We need to see more and more of Him every day. And even in the verse in Hebrews 11, it doesn't say, He persevered as one who saw the unseen one. He persevered as one seeing, seeing, I-N-G, continuing, all right, seeing the unseen one. So every day, every day, we need to see. We need to look away. We need to turn our eyes. We need to turn our heart to behold the Lord. And this becomes the strength to choose, refuse, and to persevere. All right, now, uh, in Philippians 3.8, uh, it, it talks about what happens when we really see the preciousness of the Lord. At the end of it says, I, On account of whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as refuse that I may gain Christ. Amen. So you know what? If we have to put a title on this side, what would we use? Based on Philippians 3.8, if you've really seen the Lord, you know what? This is refuse. Right? That, that's, what, that's what it says. I'm, I'm not making this up. Um, and uh, and on, on this side, we, just, we have the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Right. All right? All right, uh, can we, uh, just, hey Kenny, can we uh, lower the screen? So we just want to take a little bit of time to review a uh, real life example of, in the, of course, Moses was real too, but we want to uh, review the story. There's this, uh, these seven guys, we'll, we'll, we'll project their picture up here on the screen for you, and they were kind of uh, dubbed or Someone gave them the name, the Cambridge Seven. The Cambridge Seven. They lived in the late 1800s, and they were all college students at Cambridge University in Great Britain, and of course, a premier university in that country and the whole world, actually. So, uh, let me just read a little bit. There's there's this awesome book uh, called The Cambridge Seven. Very inspiring. I had I. I'm, I'm reading, uh, Ben gave it to me, awesome, very, very inspiring. And let me just read a little bit to you from the prologue, right, from the beginning, some various excerpts. All right, so this, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a better resolution picture. Um, but I guess they did have pictures back then in the late 1800s. So, uh, okay, here we go. Early in 1885, on a wet winter's night in London, the Strand was crowded with carriages and handsome cabs converging on Exeter Hall. Uh, we'll explain a little bit about who these people are in a little bit, so just listen to me. The large room holding 3,000 was filling rapidly with men and women of all ages and ranks. Ladies in silks and jewelry, whose carriages waited to carry them back to Belgravia or Mayfair, mingle with flower girls and working women in plain dark dresses who had found their way on foot from the East End slums. So in other words, you have very uh, rich people, and you got just the, the working class, all right? Smart young city men were sitting beside drab shopmen and kindly rogs, who on a superficial glance 
might have seemed more at home in the music hall. On the platform sat 40 Cambridge undergraduates. Above their heads hung a large map of China, stretching from side to side. On the table lay a pile of Chinese New Testaments. Again, so this is in England, 1885. All right, you got these 40 undergraduate Cambridge students on the, on the stage. Um, at the stroke of the hour, the chairman entered, followed by seven young men, slightly older than the undergraduates, but all from their dress and bearing, men of education and position. So they were not, they were educated and they had high positions in society. After prayer, a hymn, and some introductory rem remarks, those whom the world had already dubbed the Cambridge Seven rose in turn to tell the crowded hall why they were leaving England the next day to serve as missionaries in inland China. All right? So, again, large meeting, thousands of people. There's these guys, and they're going to tell people. Okay, so you have these seven guys, right? You have this guy, C.T. Studd. He was... <laughs> Uh, this goes from left to right, top to bottom. So on the top left, you have C.T. Studd. Uh, he was, according to this book, the most brilliant cricket player of his day. Um, which, uh, of course, cricket then was, was probably like NFL is today in America. So he would be like your Tom Brady or your Peyton Manning um, um, or Michael Jordan, whatever. So very household, everybody knows who this guy is. Everybody, all right? Uh, you have this guy, Montague Beauchamp, a baronet's son on the rowing team. On the rowing team. Rowing was a, a great, a prominent sport in England at the time. Maybe that would be like captain of the basketball team now. Um, um, okay, then Stanley P. Smith, uh, captain of the rowing team. Again, you got, you got some athletes. Arthur Polhill Turner, a popular student who played football, of course, as a soccer. Um, and then uh, Dixon Post, a commissioned officer in the British Army. So these two guys were both commissioned officers, uh, high ranking. One of them, one of their dads was, I think it was host. His dad was a major general in the army. So his dad had plans for him, you know what I mean? Um, and then you got this guy, William Castles. He was studying to be a minister. But anyway, uh, okay, let me uh, just read. So in the month before they went to this missionary trip in China, they kind of toured around. And uh, here, let me just read this paragraph to you. It says, For the next month, these seven young men toured the campuses of England and Scotland, holding meetings for students. God used these students to bring revival throughout Great Britain. Amen. Everywhere they went, the meeting place was always filled with people. Many, pe many people, hundreds, even a thousand, were converted each night through the simple but heart-moving testimony messages, which told simply the grace of God in their lives, and why they were going to China. Mm -hmm. Those who were converted at these meetings went out and witnessed to their friends and brought them to Christ. Every night, it was the same messages, and with the exception of Smith, none were talented speakers. They were not talented speakers. But people kept coming and coming. The Queen of England was pleased to receive a booklet containing, quote, the Cambridge Seven testimonies. God had used the Cambridge Seven to shake the foundations of a sleeping church in England and awaken her newly to the gospel of salvation and world mission. So these seven guys, they, they really shook up Great Britain at the time by making this decision as aristocratic, rich, uh, with bright future young people. And what did they do? They chose to, they really chose um, yeah. just to, to suffer. And in, not just in the coast of China, but in inland China, which at that time was very different than it is today uh, in some respects. So, um, okay, now let me just uh, read you the uh, last part here. This is the, so we, we did the prologue, now we'll do the epilogue. All right. Uh, long, after, long after the later lives of the men who formed it are forgotten, the Cambridge Seven will remain in the consciousness of the Christian church. Their social background in an aristocratic age and their athletic prowess at a time when organized games were first becoming, becoming popular, ensured them the widest hearing. Their refusal to be content with the formal piety which characterized their class endeared them to the masses for whom religion was still the core of existence. So, um, again, they, their refusal, they refused to stick with their uh, background and instead they chose to really follow the Lord. Later generations may detect in them some defects of their period, 
They did not happen to be scholars, and since they were never likely to be dependent on educational attainments for their livelihood, they saw not cause to take academic work more seriously than most undergraduates of the 1880s. So they were, they were at Cambridge, but they were probably kind of fooling around um, at, at the beginning. All right. All right, then later. Besides such criticisms must be placed the splendid sacrifice of the seven, their wholehearted devotion to the call of Christ, their intolerance of shoddy spirituality in themselves or others, and their grasp of the urgency of the gospel to unevangelized millions overseas. And particularly relevant, not one of the seven was a genius. Theirs is a story of ordinary men and thus may be repeated not only in countries of the West, but in lands which were the mission fields of a century ago, but now sent missionaries themselves. Mm -hmm. All right? So, so there you have it. I, I wish we could have time. I mean, if you just look at each one of these guys, each one has a story in themselves about how the Lord called them first to just receive Him and then how they consecrated their lives to the Lord. But all of them together, and they were college students. They were college students. But because they made such a choice, uh, choosing um, to follow the Lord, absolutely, um, the whole nation turned upside down and was brought back to the Lord, let alone, actually it also affected the United States, and of course it affected the uh, destinations of their mission, which initially was China, but ended up being India and Africa as well. So, uh, isn't that awesome? Yeah. So you can see that these guys, what, what, why did they have the strength to do something? It's because... They saw the Lord, Amen. and they continued to see Him. Right. There would have been no other explanation. And uh, that's, that's uh, how we can be today, too. They were, the title of this book is The True Story of Ordinary Men Used in No Ordinary Way. Amen. All right, so that should be the story of all of us. Amen. We're, we're, we're just here as ordinary ones, but you know what? The Lord wants to use us in no ordinary way.